Superheroes are a massive part of our culture, and pretty much have been since they were created back in the 20s, but they've never been quite as prolific as they have been in the past 15 years. It's hard to think of now, but it used to be that superheroes were this nerdy thing that version loser nerd babies liked, but now it's stranger to the public if you're not into them. It's that prolific. Outside of comics, which... Rest in peace, Bozo. Marvel releases so many films and Disney Plus shows that I could never understand anyone choosing to actively go through and keep up with all of them on a year-to-year -year basis. Like on the daily, does the average consumer spend their days speculating on the next episode of She-Hulk and how it factors into the new billion-dollar Avengers crossover? Doesn't look too healthy to me, is all I'm saying. And while DC isn't exactly on the same grind of constant content creation to the point VFX teams are dreading getting work from them, they still contribute to the superhero culture. And by now, I think it's safe to say we're reaching a breaking point. The overset saturation has gotten so extreme it feels like any day now the public's gonna crack and say enough is enough, but until that day comes, we've got satirical media to lighten the mood. Much like comics themselves, the idea of a comedic or deconstructive play on the subgenre has been around for as long as the media itself, and there are plenty of prominent examples to look at. Going as far back as the 80s, there was Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, Alan Moore's Watchmen, Rick Veach's Brat Pack, my personal favorite of that lot, and those all reinvigorated the comics industry when it was at its lowest, and I think to an extent the same is true of satirical comics from the 2000s. Mark Miller's Kick-Ass, Robert Kirkman's Invincible, and of course, Garth Ennis's The Boys. The funny thing about these three properties being they all got their own movie or TV adaptations too, so in a way they broke out into the mainstream as well. And keeping up the parallels, these adaptations all took pretty different approaches to the material than their origins. For Kick-Ass, that led to a great theatrical film and meh sequel. Invincible has an incredibly popular adult cartoon, and possibly the biggest of the three. The Boys has a mega hit of an Amazon Prime series that I believe currently ranks as the most watched original show of any stream service ever? <laughs> Wrong! Which I'd say is both wholly deserved and expected. The Boys TV show has great production value, characterization, intensity, a message, and in this way too self-referential, snarky era of comic films, it's nice to have a good heap of cynicism thrown at it, whether it's making fun of girl power while simultaneously showing the industry how to do it right, or getting a dig in on the ridiculousness of franchising for someone that's been absolutely drenched in mediocre hero content, the catharsis of it finally being called out is great. I won't say the series is perfect, there are flaws, the messaging can be a a little too blatant occasionally, and to be honest, some character developments and plot ideas I didn't quite love in the third season, but its positives far outweigh its negatives. And what's even more impressive is just how much of the series is original content. Basically, what the showrunners did was take the skeleton of what made up the boys' comic in terms of world building and basic characters, then they went in a totally different direction as seasons progressed, and I don't have a problem with that because the transition was so seamless, you could barely tell the difference if you never read the source. But for a handful of creators that did notice the changes, they had some thoughts. I won't name names here, but in in the past couple months, a few YouTubers have made videos discussing how the boys' show changed up the comics in their opinion for the better, and one video extremely negative towards the comic has risen above all the others to be the most viewed by a long shot, both by the public and in my sidebar every time I'm watching something even tangentially related. And I'm not gonna lie, seeing it all the time does annoy me, not just for the reason that I've already seen it a couple times, but rather... I think it's a bad video. Look, I'm not a commentary channel, not anymore. This video isn't gonna be about me specifically responding to this one person and tearing apart their arguments one by one. That's not what I do anymore, but it did get me thinking. Do people really hate the boys comic as much as this guy does? He's got a popular video with a healthy like to dislike ratio, so clearly it's resonating. But up to this point, I'd never seen anyone speak so harshly about it. So what better way to gauge the general consensus than put out a poll in my community tab? Like obviously my audience would know all about gritty satirical 2000s comics. That's all I talk about after. After all, for people who've never watched my channel, this sarcasm might go over their heads. So I asked the simple question of, do you think the comic origins of the boys is bad? And excluding the large percentage of people who didn't know what I was talking about, after some math, about 53.2% of viewers said yes, it's bad, 40.4% said it's okay, and in the smallest group by a long shot, 6.3% thought the comics were actually good. Looking to the comments, I wanted to see what people had to say on the matter, and beyond those that said it was a guilty pleasure for them, a majority of comments were fully negative and... A lot of them said the same thing as the most popular video on the subject, and I'm not saying they just have the same opinions, I mean they pretty much lifted what this guy said and put it into their comment line for line, bar for bar. But disregarding that funny quirk, the commenters saying the comic is bad still had a mostly unified take on the subject. It's a one-dimensional, edgy manifesto of a power fantasy carried by its art where Garth Ennis writes a fanfic about cool edgy guys in trench coats in the military killing superheroes, and then Please everyone clap. clapped. 
And I think that's an insulting interpretation. Yep, here I come with my nuclear bomb of an unpopular opinion, but I strongly believe the boys is much more than anyone in this comment section is making it out to be. It's not even a guilty pleasure of mine either. It's a great comic that has something to say. Sure, it's flawed, but so is the show. And just as much as that, I don't think it's fair to judge the comic solely based on what it does wrong without mentioning what it does right. And if you give me the time of day to explain myself, maybe I can help you see what I do. This is a defense of the boys comic from many of the common criticisms going around about it. And just for clarity, I will almost never be mentioning or comparing it to the TV show in any way unless necessary. This isn't intended to take one property down a notch, it's to show why another is just as worthy of merit on different grounds. They're both great, so let me tell you why. So wait, what is the boys comic about anyway? Well, for all the normies who haven't read it, I think you'd be better off going and reading it for yourself before I spoil it all in this video. But if you need a refresher, it's the story of Huey Campbell, a passive, friendly Scottish guy whose girlfriend dies right in front of him. Her death comes as a result of being hit by a stray villain getting beat on recklessly by A-Train, this universe's version of the Flash, leaving only her hand still gripped in Huey's. After the incident Vought, the company managing the soups, sends lawyers over and has Huey sign an NDA to protect their image, but he doesn't pay much attention to it, being so caught up in his his own grief, he doesn't know where to go. That's when Billy Butcher comes in, a cynical, seemingly carefree freelancer for the government who's bringing his team of CIA-protected operatives, the boys, back together. Among the five of them, including Huey, they all have the distinct trait of getting fucked over by soups or Vought in one way or another. So that's where their expertise lies. The group collects dirt, uncovers potential coups, roughs up teams if they have to, and generally does their best to stay in the shadows while keeping soups in line. Considering the last thing you want is a group of living nukes realizing they don't have to play by the rules. Huey gets recruited to join the boys after Butcher sees a bit of himself in him, and across 72, technically 78 issues, the group fights various soups, infiltrates their ranks, uncovers the dark truth of several organizations, and Huey comes to learn the even darker truth of who Butcher is as a person, and why both he and the boys are the way they are. So with that explanation out of the way, why is it that the series as a whole is considered one-dimensional by so many? Well, it's no secret that the creator of the boys, Garf Ennis, is staunchly opposed to the concept of superheroes in popular media. To quote him directly, he once said, There's apparently no end in sight to the saturation of film and TV by superheroes. They seem to be the perfect fantasy of hope and empowerment for a world that increasingly lacks either. Personally, not having grown up with superheroes, I find them completely moronic. His opinion in large part is substantiated by the fact he grew up in the UK, which hadn't been nearly as affected by the superhero boom as the US. When Innes was growing up, he saw a variety of psychological, horror, action, all kinds of comics really, and they appealed to all kinds of demographics. However, in the US, superheroes became the most prominent moneymakers. So companies leaned into that, and the whole industry of comics became synonymous with superheroes, meaning by extension, comics became synonymous with children's media, something that annoyed Ennis when he discovered as much. And so, based on that stance, many have come to believe that Ennis' dislike of superheroes seeps into the pages of the boys, writing them all solely for the purpose of being made fun of or turning them into degenerates with no positive qualities, so when the boys inevitably kill them, you don't feel any remorse. But that's straight up wrong? Like, it's provably false that not all superheroes and the boys are mindless cannon fodder without a shred of personality to speak of, and you're sort of missing a major theme of the series if you believe that. First, checking off the simpler acts before going into my main arguments, Super Duper is a group that, in all honesty, is shown to be kinda pathetic. Most of their members have weak powers or aren't fully there mentally, and they kinda just help around a neighborhood with minor inconveniences, but they have something none of the other main hero groups in the boys have. Innocence. They might not be able to do much, and the powers they have might be inconsistent, but they do what they can out of the goodness of their hearts. They support each other like a family, and the more competent ones make up for the follies of the weaker. It's like that feeling of kids acting in school plays. You know if they ever found out about the real world of acting or superheroing, they'd be crushed under the weight of it all, and that almost happens in the boys with the introduction of a newer, edgier leader for the group, but Huey tries putting a stop to it for their sake, wanting to preserve the pure wonder and idealism they have, knowing they don't deserve to get involved in that kind of world. Hell, the arc itself is called The Innocence, there's a clear intention here. On the funnier side, Love Sausage is an ex-Soviet hero with connections to to Butcher, that's just a fun guy all around. He's willing to help the boys when they need it, and he forms a connection with Huey. Not much explanation needed there. Tech Knight's another jokey sort of character, but he isn't all bad either. His whole subplot is about him having a tendency to, well, use any and every holy possibly can as a sex toy, and yeah, it's stupid and weird and kind of funny, but it also drives people away from him, and he intentionally pushes away those he hasn't hurt so he doesn't feel the urge to do it to them. He's not just some sick fuck, or I guess he is, since it turns out he has a brain tumor that ends up killing him when he thought he banged a meteor to save the Earth. Yeah, yeah, his story 
Corey is more played for laughs than others, but he's still not a bad guy. He has standards. And the serious, plot-relevant soups have genuinely relatable, likable, interesting personalities as well. They're the good in the sea of bad for sure, but that's the point. And no soup exemplifies that more than Starlight. But before I get to her, while we're on the topic of sex toys, this video is sponsored by AdamandEve.com, home to one of the widest selections of high-quality products to suit your deepest, darkest fantasies. And with 50 years of experience, you know they've got it handled. Now, for those that know me, you may be wondering, Braxton, as an asexual, why are you promoting this kind of website? Well, I might not choose to do it, but most of you guys don't have that excuse. Like, let's be real, if you're watching my content, you probably aren't getting much action. But if you want to get the next best thing, or potentially better, depending on your preferences, or somehow you do have an active love life and just want to spice it up, Adam and Eve is there for you with a 50% discount on your first item and free shipping in the US and Canada when you use code Just Stop at checkout. They're discreet about packaging and have a 90-day no-hassle return policy too, so whether you keep it or not, no one has to know. Thanks again to Adam and Eve for sponsoring, and back to the discussion of somehow even more degenerate content. Seeing as the general hero landscape of the boys is meant to simulate behind-the-scenes celebrity culture, putting certain individuals with exceptional talents on a pedestal, making them feel like they can do anything and get away with it, seeing as everyone else is doing the same, Starlight is our gateway into the average fan getting to be part of that world she always dreamed of, and it's not as glamorous as anyone paints it out to be. There's so much corruption at basically every level of superhero, and no one bats an eye at it because just like Starlight, many of them were once full of the same optimism and got beaten down until none of it was left. The introduction of multiple members of the Seven is then propositioning Starlight for sexual favors to prove her loyalty to the team. And while it doesn't have the same kind of personal, more specific character basis of just the Deep doing it in the show, it gives a good indication of the culture around soups. This isn't some kind of fluke, it's the norm. You're expected to do it for fame. And there isn't a single person that thought was going to object to it. In fact, they encourage it if they can make a profit. But instead of buckling under the weight and giving up like all the soups before her, Starlight decides to fight back when the harassment and sexualization of her image goes too far for her to handle. Trying to integrate assault as a backstory element to justify her dressing scantily when she had real experiences with it and feels insulted. There's something super personal about her thoughts on those kind of ideas in particular, and it makes her reaction so much more real. We see a slow deterioration of her mental state as she tries to play into the charade and become jaded, yet can't. Her moral compass and sentimentality won't allow her to become corrupted, and Huey's the one that knows that side of her more than anyone. You see, around the time the two were both getting into their diametrically opposing jobs, they met each other, not as we Huey and Starlight, but as Huey Campbell and Annie January. They bond over the reluctance they both have at the jobs they're committed to, though they're never upfront about either for obvious reasons, and they eventually decide to be a couple, leading to dates in between their turbulent lives that offer insight into how they're currently feeling. The moments between them are often short, at least for us, but as they get closer, it becomes increasingly evident that what's keeping both of them sane in these hard times they're going through full of difficult decisions and gratuity is each other. It's like they're in a little bubble that all the pain in their lives can't reach. Much like for the audience, these scenes give the two a break from everything else to be sweet and carefree, something that's broken apart when they find out about each other's secrets about two-thirds of the way through the comic's run. And that reveal happening so late seriously makes it hit harder. We've gotten to see them both fall in love, connect, understand each other, and all while they have to deal with a ton of bullshit, endearing us to the fact that they can both have something so loving in between it all. Something pure and innocent. So them being torn apart by those very things they used each other to heal from is heartbreaking and super emotionally resonant. We'll get to how that factors into Huey's character in due time, but for Starlight, she doesn't know what to do with herself anymore. And one of the people to pull her out of that rut, inadvertently, is another soup, Queen Maeve, who's implied to be what Starlight could turn into if she doesn't have some beacon or source of optimism to keep her going. And Maeve is perfectly aware of the situation she's in. She hates all the other seven members, drowns herself in alcohol or burly men constantly, and does inside work for the boys by placing cameras in the crew's helicarrier base. She hates everything the Seven stand for that much, and more than that, she fears what could happen if they really had the reins to do anything, knowing firsthand the destruction they can cause. And so she's the only one willing to stand up for Starlight when she can't find the courage or sturdiness to do it herself. How could you ever say either of these two don't serve a purpose or have depth when it's so abundantly clear they do? Starlight is far more than just Huey's girlfriend, she's her own person full of hopes and dreams and internal struggles that hold equal narrative relevance to all Huey and the boys go through. Maeve isn't just another member of the Seven, she's a reflection of women in the entertainment industry, exploited and made to serve as sex symbols for so long, the only times they can ever feel anything is when they want to stop it happening to others. She and Annie are both sympathetic as hell, and they aren't the only ones either. Looking at the G-Men storyline in issues 23 to 30, or as it's called officially, we've gotta go now, after a member of the main branch publicly kills herself in a small town, while another of the boys' mother's milk looks into the death, Huey's given the duty of infiltrating the G-Men to place cameras. Now, in most situations, it'd be almost impossible to slither into a team of soups without Vought picking it up, but management of the G-Men is left up to one man, John Godolkin, who has an agreement with Vod for merchandising but otherwise works independently. Basically, he's got the final say, and because of that freedom, he's created a massive network of teams encompassing dozens of soups, so one new guy slipping into a smaller branch isn't gonna turn heads. Public
publicly, Godolkin claims the reason for this is to make a big happy family, but Huey realizes something is up with his subsection G-Wiz pretty quickly. They're all nice and welcoming and supportive of Huey being part of the team, but the shit they do together goes way beyond innocent frat boy pranks. The group's a little too comfortable with themselves. There's no boundaries they aren't willing to cross, whether it's pissing on each other or helping a homie use his joystick if you catch my drift. For those of you who don't get the joke, They don't see it as weird at all, they think it's funny, and it takes Huey a bit of time to really get suspicious considering... Come on, have you heard of what college kids do? Just look where the band Limp Biscuit got their name from. It'll ruin your day. But after a while, he's wise enough to know there's something wrong and expresses as much to the team. Butcher doesn't care though, since it isn't part of the mission, and wants Huey to drop the topic and get out of there before he's found out. But Huey's closeness to them makes him want to stay for the funeral of the dead member and hopefully convince them to come with. He wants to save these younger guys from ending up like all the other members of the G-Men and their subgroups, who are all angry and assholish and overall unpleasant, Godolkin at the head trying to keep them all together. And it's MM uncovers the backstory of the dead G-Men, Godolkin's sinister nature and G-Wiz's behavior becomes all the more understandable. As a cover story for the group, the G-Men are all portrayed as orphans that Godolkin found and raised as his own to become soups, but in reality, the situation is much darker. Huey is actually one of the only G-Men to be allowed in who wasn't part of the group since childhood, and there's a reason for that. Godolkin didn't find these kids in orphanages or begging for a home, he found them off the street. He picked them up in his limo full of candy and promised them all the powers they could ever ask for, which he could indeed give them through the injection of compound. V, and children are naturally going to accept that opportunity. All for one thing in return. Something that robbed them all of the innocence they went into that limo having. The g -Wiz kids don't have boundaries as a result of, at a young age, Godolkin stealing their bodily autonomy. He made them feel like their bodies were nothing to be treasured or taken care of, and filled them in a frat house for a dozen years to let them be artificially made superheroes with no idea of social cues or norms. It's not the fault of the G-Men for being deranged and accepting what Godolkin did to them. It's not the fault of G-Wiz for being good kids that got in a bad situation. It's all Godolkin's fault, and Vaught, who let it slide for so long in the hopes that nothing bad would happen. They took action when they thought something could damage their public image, but the scars left by Godolkin's actions are left in bold. And Huey feels it deep to his core when that is revealed. He's so maddened that it had to happen to these kids he came to think of as true friends. And he wants to end the madness or die trying, and the boys all unify with him in that decision, charging ahead with no plan in mind. Honestly, if Vod didn't come in to kill the G-Men, that could have been the end for the boys. And it was all for the sake of those kids turned into monsters or objects, their humanity ripped away. What's so uncomplicated about that? And the G-Men's sustained existence really draws me back to discussing the true main villain of the boys. It's not the Seven or superheroes as a concept, it's the company that creates and packages them. The group that hides all their devious activities and takes out anyone trying to find the truth. The AC. Vought, American Consolidated. It's a common misconception that the main focus of the boys' commentary is centered on superheroes, and don't get me wrong, they play a big part. But in the end, they're just the product of a company. One that's whole goal has been to get inventory shipped out at any cost, no matter the sacrifice. Though I believe the show went down a different path having to do with the bad German men of the 1930s in relation to their founding, in the comics, Vought originally prided itself on being an American company, and used their connections to conduct business during the Vietnam War in the most American way possible cheaply. They sold weapons to the military so inefficient they made for better sticks to put the heads of the soldiers killed by using them on, and when controversy broke, they slithered into the shadows so they come back again under a different name and do it all over again a few years later. Heroes were just another evolution in their cheap technology. They found a way to pump an average Joe full of chemicals, get him some random power, and then send him on his merry way to a field of whatever country was willing to pay enough. And don't think soups didn't have to be improved as well. Hell, after the first incarnation of soups failed, they just passed the costumes down to new schmucks. At that time, product was disposable, so there there was no concern how shitty it was as long as they could go away and come back until reaching a bare minimum for their product to function. And the Seven were the group to make that distinction. They fueled toy lines, action figures, movies, and by that point it became apparent to Vod that they couldn't dispose of these guys like the others, at least not easily. So they had to protect them. A scandal getting out means the product is ruined all over again, and after becoming so large, fucking off and getting back into talks with the military about Soups joining the army is gonna be a pretty tough sell. But that's Vod's plan, to get Soups involved with national defense like they used to be with their shoddy weapons. Technology Technology may have changed, but their practices haven't, and that mentality is personified in the CEO of Vought, James Stillwell. Now, for fans of the boys' TV show, you may remember Madeline Stillwell as a kind of emotional attachment for Homelander, the only one that can calm him down when he's angry. But in the comic, he's the exact opposite. James Stillwell, in all honesty, is not a man. And I'm not saying that like he's an alien or something, or he doesn't have pride, he is indeed a human, but I don't view him like that. More a byproduct and spokesman for everything so hateable about any megacorporation in existence. Totally 
amoral. I understand that certain groups and ideologies think the biggest companies around, whether it's Disney or Apple or Microsoft, are all evil companies hell-bent on doing whatever they need to for money, but that's looking at it from the wrong perspective. Companies don't go out of their way to enforce slave labor on the production of their merchandise or the systemic exploitation of a country's resources for modern technology. It's just something they think needs to happen so they can conduct business. It doesn't mean every one of the company is okay with these practices, hell, they could be against them in every way. But they still sign off on it because in their eyes, it's not something they can avoid if they want to keep profits up. They could be more hospitable to their workers or the limited resources on Earth, but that's not as cost-effective, so why should they? Large corporations are always going to take the cheapest route to get the most out of their funding, so if slave labor is the cheapest option, they could be as pro-union as you want. It doesn't mean the decision is any less obvious. And in a way, that's way more despicable than true evil ever could be. Disney doesn't have some crusade against Yeagers that made them want to film some scenes for Mulan outside of Chinese concentration camps. They just didn't care. It wasn't a big deal for them. They're on the side of profit, and it just so happens that regularly, that pendulum swings more on the unsavory one than good. And James Stilwell is a concentrated amalgam of that. He's cold, calculated, and is the embodiment of the pen being stronger than the sword, knowing how to eat away at a potential attacker without laying a finger. Among the staff of Vought, there's no one more guilty of allowing soups to get away with heinous shit. And though he's smart enough to take action when necessary, he's got just as much wherewithal to burn the company to the ground and collect insurance when he needs to. Case in point, Homelander's attempted coup of the US government using soups. Everything has gone to shit. After the soups organize a massive raid on the White House, the boys reveal all they've got on as many soups as they can. It doesn't matter what or how, there's no incentive to hold back anymore, so the image Vought so carefully built has completely tumbled down like a Jenga tower, and Stillwell knows what's going to happen next in more ways than one. First, Homelander shows up drenched in blood with his most evil look at Stillwell's office. He wants to look intimidating, undefeatable, a god of rage and mischief out for the heads of any mortals willing to cross his path. But. James knows that isn't what he is. To an average so-and-so, the act Homelander's putting on would make him shit their pants and suffer a heart attack, but Stillwell can't even be bothered to give a reaction. His face is pure humdrum. He's not surprised or shocked or the slightest bit taken aback, he doesn't care. And the rationale he has for why is genius. For all Homelander did across the comics, killing people, forcing sex, etc., none of it's impressive. He's got no personality, no shock factor. Homelander is doing exactly what any edgy Joe Schmo given superpowers would do if he wanted to be the Super Gestapo. And to that extent, Homelander has the ability to rip Stillwell limb from limb while he's explaining as much, but he doesn't. Fuck it, Stillwell asks Homelander to kill him, and when he doesn't, James says he'll do it himself. And Homelander doesn't want that to happen, for the reason that, as much as he wants to act like Stillwell's approval means nothing to him, it's not true. Homelander wants validation. He wants to be impressive to the people that never gave him that word, but he can't. And when the coup's done, leaving all those heroes dead, Stillwell moves on. Through a careful web of planning, he backs away without any repercussions by pinning the blame on his assistant, who he built up as being so important to the company, so she'd never see it coming when it turned out that role was as a scapegoat. Then what does he do after rebuilding the company under a different name? Start up the same shit under a new alias. But it doesn't matter how it's redone. In the end, as Stillwell's last line in the comic perfectly sums up, it's all bad product. And among them, the most prominently displayed soup, representing all they stand for, is the Homelander himself. And to say exactly what that representation is, we need to talk about the big twist of the comic. In contrast to the TV version of the character, Homelander in the comic starts out exactly like all the other bigwigs, if not a tad more pretentious and prone to anger. Other than what he did to Starlight in the beginning, among his worst offenses, he supposedly assaulted Butcher's wife, who subsequently died when his supposed child clawed out of her, and an instance where his ineptitude led to a different version of 9-11, in which the plane hit the Brooklyn Bridge instead of the Twin Towers. But here's the thing, though he remembers what happened during the plane jacking, he he doesn't remember the assault of Butcher's wife. In fact, he doesn't remember a lot of the craziest shit the boys have pictures of him supposedly doing. And as the comic continues, this idea really eats away at him. Why can't he recall this terrifying stuff he's done? Why does he have a compulsion not to do it when he's conscious? After some thought, he decides it's the godly, no fucks given sight of him that can do whatever, and to prove to himself that he is the person in those photos and follow the mentality that can do whatever, he stages the coup, kills the president, and uses his skull for some shit we thankfully don't see drawn. But still, there's some ruthlessness missing. It's not extreme as well eating a baby while it's still alive. So what gives? Turns out, it wasn't Homelander doing those things at all. It was another hero, Black Noir, who's revealed to be a clone of Homelander with military skills created to kill him if he ever goes too far off the deep end. But Homelander never did, at least not before those pictures started giving him ideas, so the clone gets restless. It goes insane with bloodlust wanting to do something, so he puts on the Homelander outfit and does everything in those pictures. Then he sends it to the boys to keep Homelander in line, or even release them so he has a justification to kill. Either way, it's a win-win for him. And after Homelander has done so much horrible shit to try living up to that standard, he's ruined his image, his fame, and his career. All to try proving he was special when he never was. To some, this is a bad twist because it means Homelander isn't a special individual like he is in the TV show, to which I raise the idea that... <clears throat> 
that's the point. Homelander from birth has been led to believe he is special, that he's a god amongst men who shines above all the other soups as truly superior or deistic. But he isn't. Homelander is an average guy who's got mega powers. There's nothing divine about any of what he does, and there's really no point beyond self-pleasure or adoration. The reason he's never personally ripped someone's guts out while they were still alive is that on a basic human level he understands it's wrong, and that's definitely part of why he's so taken aback by his own repulsion. He's been told he's a god and raised like a piece of military equipment his whole life. Why would a god care about mortal deaths? It's that humanity in him that he oh so hates, that thing that Stillwell used to judge Homelander's actions in the moment he wants to be so impressive. He can't think beyond the confines of human imagination like Black Noir can. There's a piece of his human nature still left, and that informs Stillwell on how boring Homelander's crew will be, which enrages him since Homelander knows it's true. But the pictures, the pictures show he is a god! But those pictures aren't of him, are they? There are someone that looks like him but isn't. Someone stronger. So not only is he not a god, he's not the strongest among his peers either. He's another asshole that got taught to believe he was above all the rest, but he wasn't. That's what all the biggest villains of the comic have in common, and the boys are there to take them off their pedestal. But don't get it twisted. That doesn't mean for one second that the boys is up. I've already mentioned Innes' well-known dislike for superheroes on a conceptual level, but that also leads a lot of the boys' main critics to point at the series as a blatant power fantasy, a way for Innes to get all his adolescent hatred for superheroes out by writing about them getting ripped to shreds by a bunch of Innes' black trench-coated sardonic edgelord OCs, and at the end of the day, they're the good guys because all soups are bad and the boys always have good justifications. I'm gonna have to strongly disagree with that again, though, especially the part about the boys always being in the right or portrayed as the good guys. Just look at Butcher. Comparative to the rest, Butcher is a good bit more aggressive and vindictive in his killings or targets than others. He doesn't just hate soups for all the bad they've done to him in his life. That's mixed in, sure, but Butcher's hatred reaches something more primal. He's willing to let any soup, no matter how innocent or guilty, no matter how old or young they are, die if he doesn't do the killing himself. Even Super Duper, who I mentioned before, when they were about to be killed and assaulted, Butcher didn't stop anything until it was Huey's ass on the line trying to save them. If they're donning the mask and boots, Butcher immediately has no respect for them or their lives, and considering his bad Story, while an aversion to soups would be understandable, what Butcher does across the series could be seen as no less than absolutely cruel. And he doesn't try to hide this at all, he wears it on his sleeve in fact, and that makes more characters, including Huey, afraid of him. Really, I'd compare him to a mix of the Punisher and a more extreme J. Jonah Jameson if that makes sense. Punisher in that he indiscriminately kills those he considers worthy of it without hesitation, often requiring others to stop him, and Jameson in that he inherently hates soups for a personal reason. JJJ is always writing articles about how bad Spider-Man is because he thinks any Anyone who wears a mask is a coward, explained through his backstory of a masked burglar killing a loved one, and Butcher to me feels like if that hatred was manifested into a more physical, vengeance-driven version. Besides Huey, the characters that echo this identity of Butcher the most vehemently are the two that have known him the longest. An old comic writer with all the dirt on soups, the legend, and the former leader of the boys that took Butcher in in the first place, Greg Mallory. Instead of a person, they more liken him to an unstoppable force slamming into an immovable object until he can smash right through to get to the next. What he's done and able to do is what scares either of them, it's his conviction. The inability almost anyone has to truly get through to him on an emotional level. For the most part, he's closed himself off so far no one can reach him, so all they can do is try to get away and fail to forget or watch the fireworks since they can't put him out mid-flight. And what stings most to them is how they, more so Mallory, fueled the flames of that conviction until they couldn't control it and he couldn't hold it back, only getting more extreme as the comic run continues, and the boys start getting fed up. Specifically, they start turning on Butcher when he puts Huey through tests to make sure he isn't a spy, prompting them to scold him after Huey almost dies. Through their casual interactions, it's obvious the gang has a begrudging respect for Butcher and a similarly sized hatred for superheroes, but when it comes to their own, bonds go deeper than that, exemplified by how the crew brought out all the stops to beat the second strongest soup, Stormfront, after he puts the female in a hospital and tried going after the gang. They're loyal to one another above all else during missions, and Butcher, until near the end of the series, upholds that belief strongly through his actions, so when the boys start seeing cracks in that unspoken code, they call him out for it, and there's some time given before they fully make up, whereas in previous disagreements, they'd usually do it in the same issue. But while that's the most obvious indication of the boys' loyalty to Butcher's word, it isn't the first. Looking to another example of the gang siding with Huey over Butcher, during the Godolkin incident, Butcher doesn't see the reason in fighting for the sake of soups, comparing it to saving strippers, even after hearing about the abductions. But the rest of the boys are willing to die alongside Huey, prompting Butcher to change his mind. And that overall interaction is a real testament to the dichotomy between Butcher and Huey. Butcher believes there isn't a single soup worth saving and no one can stop him from doing what he does. 
is. But that's exactly what Huey is meant to do as the protagonist after his introduction, and it's written all over his stories. In no short abundance since the beginning, Huey has been an antithesis to Butcher in almost every way. And while Butcher wants to quote, toughen him up into something more resembling himself through experiencing the most brutal situations life has to offer, the adventures he goes on only cause Huey's original convictions to grow even stronger. Every major storyline he's strongly tied into, Huey is shown a new set of heroes, whether they're his target or not, and he connects with them in some way. He talks to and understands them in a way Butcher is never willing to take the time to do so himself. He scolds them if he thinks they deserve it instead of up and killing them, since he believes they, like most people, have the ability to change. It's almost like none of Butcher's teachings got through to him, but that's to build up to a heartbreaking moment when it finally does. That being the reveal of Annie as a superhero. Up to this point, as in issue 45 of the comic, amidst Huey and Annie acting as emotional supports for one another and becoming closer as a couple, Annie has been trying to bring herself to tell Huey who she is and what she had to do in order to prove herself to the Seven. It's slowly eaten away at her, watching atrocity after atrocity, seeing horror after horror, mirroring Huey's own story somatically, and much like him, she's thought about quitting the whole thing to be with him, even more so after hearing of Homelander's plans for the coup. And it just so happens that the time she feels is best to tell him comes at the moment he chooses to explain what happened to his first girlfriend and how he's been molded to hate soups. Regardless, she tells him anyway, knowing she has to, as well as all she's dealt with, and in a way similar to Pavlovian conditioning, or more accurately, I guess the Ludovico method from Clockwork Orange, Huey's wiring to relate superheroing with all the worst of humanity has reached so deep to his core he can't help but vomit at the idea she's one as well. That's not what drives him over the edge though. Despite it all, Huey does as his character would in that kind of situation and comes to view her intentions as good, which they were, and thinks he can get over it considering he lied to her in the same way, so they're kinda even. But then something else happens that breaks him. He learns about what Starlight did for the Seven, including A-Train via Butcher, who found the incident on camera. It may have happened before the two of them met, but regardless, Butcher then uses the footage to worm into Huey's thoughts that Starlight has been laughing at him this whole time. She never loved him, it was all an experiment. She's just like all the rest. And what's so great about the moment is that Butcher is under the impression he's telling Huey the truth of his words. He doesn't know Starlight or all the buildup she's been doing to tell him and how remorseful she is about the act, but he thinks he does. And that's why he tells Huey, not only as another reminder of what soups are, but so Huey can stop being played for a fool based on his presumption. Of course, this isn't the case, but thanks to Butcher and his now present prejudice against soups, Huey believes it, and even though he knows he shouldn't, he walks away. The whole scenario is soul-crushing considering we've seen how much these characters care for each other over the course of the series, knowing each other while being oblivious at the same time. But thankfully, Huey ultimately overcomes this prejudice, knowing that she'd never want to hurt him, and that signals another big part of his character, how accepting and empathetic he is compared to the rest of the boys. Recently, there's been a bit of a debate by some about whether or not parts of the boys' comic might be, well, problematic, and I won't deny, beyond the gory imagery, some groups, like the LGBT, are represented in a way that, from the outset, might appear as though they're being made fun of or insulted based on dialogue, such as when slurs are used. But firstly, the characters that do this are basically always antagonists or bad guys, such as Homeland or Stormfront, who, I should remind you, is a literal Nazi. They're not exactly glorifying the action and implying you should do or enjoy this is what I'm saying, but to a lesser extent, another character apathetic to groups like the LGBT is Butcher, who sees them dying or having bad things happen to them as a joke because of who they are. He doesn't straight up call them slurs or act outwardly hateful, but he isn't an ally either, and that's something that, as it goes on, really gets under Huey's skin. On one of his first missions, he has to investigate the death of a gay teen that might have something to do with a soup, and while Butcher focuses more on who might have done it or how the boys could use it against the unknown soup, Huey's attention is squared on the face the teen made. It wasn't reminiscent of fear or anger or surprise, but misery, a face Huey's all too familiar with considering the death of his girlfriend. He empathizes with the kid, regardless of his sexuality, and the same is true when they look into the death of a trans escort. Huey wants to know what she was like to get a good profile of why this might have happened to her, all the other escorts that knew her are fleshed out as real people, and they aren't drawn in a stereotypical way either. It's all honestly pretty respectful for a mid to late 2000s comic, and Huey, while admittedly he isn't too comfortable in their presence, still thinks of them as human beings that deserve just as much urgency as anyone else when they're murdered, and he doesn't agree that the simple fact of a soup being gay or with a trans person should be usable as a blackmail source. The fact a person was murdered should be the focus, not how their identity can make the murderer look bad for reasons outside of murder. Like, that's some strongly progressive commentary that still holds up and rings true today. The boys wasn't regressive or dated, it was ahead of its time. And Huey represents that in a person, all while having that aspect of his character continue to oppose Butcher's views of heroes and what it takes to bring him down. Same thing is true in regards to violence. Huey has never been a super confrontive guy, and if anything, the death of his girlfriend only made him even more opposed to the stuff. And you guessed it, that's in strict opposition to Butcher and the boys, who revel in the stuff to an unhealthy degree. So many times, Huey's tried to minimize or avoid violence whenever possible, which makes Butcher push him harder and harder to get tough and do it like him. All going back to the moment Butcher forcibly injects Huey with Compound V. For all my TV-only viewers, Compound V works slightly
slightly differently in the comics. Disregarding the permanent shit only the top soups can afford, Tenth V does exist in some capacity, but it's just a cut version of the pure stuff and doesn't have harsh side effects like in the show. For cost reasons, that's what the boys themselves and most average soups use, and it's what Butcher jams into Huey without his consent. You see, beyond making it possible for Huey to fight on the same level as soups when needed, at this point in the story, he was reluctant to officially join the boys, so Butcher jammed it into him to show what powers he could have against the soups if he chose to stay. There's just one problem with it. Huey's horrified by the powers and tries not to use them whenever possible, as would be expected of his character, so Butcher makes up for it by being somehow even more aggressive against those who would want to do Huey harm. He does seriously care about the guy and wants him to be strong, feeling a bond to Huey like he did for his now-dead younger brother, but after enough attempts fail, he gives it one final try using the ultimate prize. A train hogtied and served to Huey on a silver platter. He gives Huey the ultimate chance for vengeance that Butcher himself longed for for so long, and though it takes some egging on to make him do it, Huey does kill him. However, something strange happens. Huey doesn't feel fulfilled or relieved or at peace at all. He's killed the person that caused him so much grief in the first place, yet he feels empty inside, coming to regret the decision, and that's echoed by Butcher after he kills Black Noir, knowing deep down that his wife never would have wanted him to do it. He did so much shit to get to the point he could avenge his wife, whether it was maiming and killing or taking a substance used by those he fought against. The hypocrisy didn't matter to him as long as it could help him reach his ultimate goal, and when it was done, Nothing. Just like Huey. But regardless of if he could see the error of his philosophy, by this point he knew nothing, including himself, could stop what he had planned next, transitioning us into... Wait a second, just stop. You're telling me there's something that happens after the coup fails and Homelander dies? I thought it ended right there. Oh, you poor, sweet, misguided child. No, that's not the ending. Not by a long shot. And for those who did know it goes beyond that point, I should clarify to them that the ending isn't just Butcher kills the boys because, and whoever decided not to explain it beyond that is straight up excluding context, emotional payoff, themes, and can kindly suck my dick. No, contrary to what you may have been led to believe, Butcher doesn't systematically kill off the boys as well as other characters just because of because. He does it to keep them from stopping his planned genocide of every person that's ever come into contact with Compound V using a remote detonator from one of the highest points in the country, reaching into the potential millions when taking into account factory workers exposed to V in varying capacities and all the average people Soobs have interacted with. Remember how him using Temp V was what he considered scorched earth in the show? Well, bitch, you ain't seen nothing yet. With this one action, he wants to make it so everyone, whether innocent or not, never has the capability of not only using superpowers, but possibly developing them in the future. He gets the whole thing set up with the help of the inventor of Compound V, just as he previously used him to create the V-seeking missiles the US military used against the revolting soups during the coup. And he wants to make sure no one he knows has the capacity to stop him, no matter how much it hurts for him. And it does. At the start of the arc, he attempted to split them up so they didn't find out and could die instantly like everyone else, but when Huey gets suspicious, as Butcher had anticipated, he knew he had to kill them off. That is, other than Huey, who Butcher was in a position to kill if he wanted to, but didn't. And when everyone else is gone, Huey understands why. He was always meant to stop Butcher. All this time from the beginning of Huey's stay with the boys, through all the hardship and fucked up scenarios and cruelty, Butcher wanted Huey to stop him because he knew no one else would, not even himself. The man had become so detached from his actions that he viewed it like a dream, so logically, the only way to stop him would be to draw out that part of his person Butcher buried so deep within him when being cruel. And he knew Huey would be the only one capable of doing it. Like he and the others have said multiple times, Huey isn't like them. He's a decent person. He reminds Butcher of his dead younger brother, which is later on confirmed to be a second secondary reason for his descent into hateful vengeance, so who else would be better to stop him? All those times Butcher told Huey he needed to go through horrible things to toughen him up, it wasn't in the sense that Huey would become numb to it all like the rest of the boys, quite the opposite. Other than for plain survival, it was in the hopes that he'd get so fed up with it all, he'd find the bravery to look Butcher in the eye and no longer be afraid as he takes him down once and for all. But that just wouldn't be Huey. He could never be a cold-blooded killer, and in the final few issues, that's exemplified. After all the boys have been taken out, Huey's left contemplating where Butcher will go and, more importantly, if it's possible to beat him. He knows in a physical fight it's impossible for him to win, and he still fears what Butcher's capable of more than anything, but upon figuring out where he's going to go, Huey knows there's no time to think and meets up with Butcher atop the Empire State Building, hoping to figure it out as he goes. The time comes for him to do something, and Huey can't seem to muster much but talk, so Butcher provokes him into taking action, using his knowledge of Huey's insecurities to make it happen. However, Huey being Huey, instead of attacking Butcher directly, like he wanted, he haphazardly charges forward and falls out a window, only for Butcher to grab on, showing that even in the 
this moment, Butcher still cares enough to keep Huey from dying, and Huey's still kind enough to apologize when grappling onto Butcher's busted hand. Then, when the two both fall, Butcher explains to Huey how to patch up a leg injury he gets from being screwed on a pike. It's a great way of indicating that, despite the circumstances, their relationship hasn't changed all that much, and with that in mind, Butcher knows Huey won't be able to kill him unless he's manipulated into it. So, during their final exchange, after telling Huey to have a good life with Annie, and explaining his thought process for getting to this moment, he tells Huey he killed his parents. No, not just that, he goes into explicit detail about what his parents looked like, how they reacted when he killed them, and completely sells it to Huey that he actually did it. But once the deed is done, Huey recognizes what's just happened, calls his parents, and discovers they were fine all along. Butcher had indeed visited them a year ago, but he was nothing but kind to them, and asked them to say hi to Huey the next time he called. In classic Butcher fashion, he had it all planned out from the beginning, and was able to manipulate Huey's emotions for just long enough to finalize his own death. It's so poignant and memorable as an ending for the character's dynamic. Of course, to not leave the comic ending all doom and gloom, there's a final issue afterwards confirming Huey and Annie's happiness, Vought's failed attempt to get back into the soup game, the immortalizing of Frenchie and M.M. in the newly rebuilt Brooklyn Bridge, and Butcher pulling a bit of last-minute trolling post-mortem, but that's the end. The boys' comic is not perfect. Aside from the violence and dark themes used to make a point, I won't deny it can be edgy just for edgy comedy's sake, and though I usually end up laughing more times than not, I can get how it wouldn't be everyone's cup of tea. But by no means is it one-dimensional, shallow, a power fantasy, unoriginal, or poorly planned. It had something to say and carried consistent themes across its run. It had interesting characters, dynamics, and ways of shaking things up when it needed to. The world-building and heavy commentary it placed on corporate America and the industrial complex is nuanced and as impactful today as it was over a decade ago. The various artists hired for the comic gave distinctive, detailed, memorable spins and made the fight scene super easy to follow. Sure, the fights rarely had major stakes and often had a clear winner, but by now I hope you understand the fights themselves aren't what made them stick, but the character motivations, developments, and story changes indicated because of them. The Boys is anything but a typical superhero versus anti-hero story, so I wouldn't have expected anything less. Garfin has once said in an interview before the Boys TV show release that Billy Butcher is his favorite character to have written, and of course with the general mindset surrounding the comic these days, a lot of people interpret that as him admitting he loved writing a character that got to beat up soup super easily while being depicted in a positive light. But in retrospect to the comics, there's a whole other interpretation I get from it. Innes instilled an aspect of himself into the character, a dislike for the superhero industry, and built off it to make a multi-layered, fascinating antagonist, seeing how far that hatred could get him before someone found a way to stop it. At least, that's how it reads to me. But whatever the takeaway, always remember this. Anyone that says the boys is basic... can go fuck themselves. I've been just up. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.